real pleasure to join you here in this new Zoom world of intellectual stimulation, such as it is. Um, I'm here to talk with you about my new book, The Hispanic Republican, The Shaping of an American Political Identity from Nixon to Trump, and it was published at the end of May. I'm going to share some slides with you. So I'll share my screen now. Hopefully this isn't too distracting here. Um, okay. The topic of my book is relevant, of course, to the election that's just a few weeks away. Latinos are the second largest group of voters for the first time this year. And if you're paying attention to the news, you've heard plenty from the Latinos for Trump campaign about socialism, canceling Goya beans, as well as immigrant opportunity, entrepreneurship, government control, and other topics that appeal to the 30% of Latino voters I've written about. But I'm going to focus my presentation on my historical findings and then at the very end of my talk and even more in discussion, we can talk about the present and anything else you want, really. First and foremost, I wanted to write a book about Hispanic Republicans and I, I should just say right at the outset that I'm using the term Hispanic because that's the term that many of the actors that I wrote about prefer as opposed to Latino or certainly not Latinx. And we can talk about that later too. So I wanted to begin to fill in some of the gaps in our knowledge about Latinas and Latinos in the United States. And I tackled one big idea held by the general public and even many scholars that Latinos are monolithic political actors, that they're overwhelmingly Democrats, and stated more strongly that they are natural Democrats. I don't think that Latinos are naturally anything. I think that their diverse political identities are a product of history. To be clear, most Hispanics do vote for Democrats, about two thirds of them, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. They've voted for the Democratic presidential candidate since the days of Richard Nixon in the late 60s and early 70s. But this also means that almost one third of Hispanics who amount to millions of voters every election have gotten ignored. And I think media coverage hasn't always helped us understand these voters after elections, articles report that the Democrat, quote, crushed the Republican or that they won in a landslide, but then they leave it at that. And to the extent that media tries to explain Latino support for Republicans, they focus on particular issues like abortion or Catholicism or military service, wealth, and even skin color or age cohort. I think political scientists also haven't helped us understand Hispanic Republicans. They acknowledge that some Hispanics and Latinos are Republicans, but they've focused on the supermajority of Hispanics and Latinos who are liberal, with the result that they too ignore the millions who are conservative. They argue that liberalism is a core part of Latino identity based on attitude surveys, finding that a majority of Hispanics and Latinos support government intervention in the economy, or that they favor a comprehensive immigration reform, including a pathway to citizenship for undocumented immigrants. The one finding that usually lends credence to the idea that Hispanics and Latinos are conservative, they note, is the aversion of Hispanics and Latinos to welfare and other so-called entitlement programs. And I think by pointing to these things, media and political scientists have missed a bigger picture. First, there's no single issue or national group that can explain why Hispanics have identified as Republicans. These attitude surveys, which find that a certain percentage of Hispanics support X while a certain percentage supports Y, and then infer that Hispanics are conservative or liberal based on such findings, can be misleading. To take just one example, religion cuts in many different directions. Certain aspects of the Catholic tradition can be seen as conservative, such as opposition to abortion, while others can be seen 
as liberal, including a strong Latin American tradition of liberation theology. And moreover, while there's still a, a greater number of Hispanics who are Catholic, the fastest growing religion among them is evangelical Christianity. And evangelicals themselves aren't even monolith monolithically conservative. It's a faith that many immigrants practiced in Latin America, then brought with them to the United States, and the Latino evangelical vote gets split between Republicans and Democrats. But it's certainly the case that more Latino evangelicals vote for Republicans than Latinos in general. So my point is that religion is complicated and you can't chalk up their partisan identity to Catholicism specifically. Nor can you chalk it up to their national background. It has long been assumed that Cubans are the Hispanic Republicans par excellence. And when I interviewed many of the California-based Mexican Americans who were active in Republican Party politics in the 1960s, they scoffed at this idea. One man that I interviewed said that Cuban Americans, quote, didn't really matter until 1980 when Ronald Reagan brought them into the conservative movement. Before then, many Cubans were still focused on overthrowing Castro and returning to the island, and as a result, didn't naturalize in great numbers until the mid-1970s. And most who naturalized and voted were as likely to support Democrats as Republicans. Jimmy Carter, for example, won half of the Cuban American vote in 1976, and that only shifted in 1980 with Reagan, and even more so with the establishment by Jorge Mascanosa of the Cuban American National Foundation in 1981. So again, it wasn't only Cubans, it was also, and in many ways, primarily Mexican Americans and Puerto Ricans who launched and grew the Hispanic Republican movement. I think journalists and political scientists have also missed how partisan loyalty to the Republican Party has developed over the past two generations from the 1950s forward. And this is the big picture that I'm trying to bring into view by moving away from their focus on particular moments like the Cuban Revolution for particular national groups and particular issues. So those are some of the big points that I'm trying to make. And I try to do so in four parts. The first part is called awakening. It's when Hispanics began moving toward the Republican Party. Part two is called inclusion. And it's about the period when Ni Richard Nixon in particular made a greater effort than any Republican before him to include Hispanics. The third section is called Doubt, and it's about the time when Hispanics were simultaneously more included in politics than ever before, but also when they began to doubt whether either party was truly committed to their full incorporation. And finally, the last section is Loyalty, and that's about the period when, uh, the more recent period, when Hispanic Republicans were dismayed with the party's rightward turn on immigration and failure to achieve other goals but never fully abandoned the party. And I think that we're still in this moment today. I begin my book in the 1950s. Dwight Eisenhower was the first Republican president that Hispanics rallied around. It didn't happen as part of a national movement, but it was the result of the efforts of particular activists in the Southwest, especially in California. Hispanics became more politically active as a result of their participation in World War II. As many have noted, veterans and others began to demand individual and collective rights. Veterans in particular identified with Eisenhower because they saw him as their general. He was the military leader that most helped the United States win the Cold War and with the post-war reconstruction efforts in Europe he would be the Cold War leader the country needed, many Hispanics believed. But as much as Hispanics began to move toward the Republican Party, the party, both parties actually, began to move toward them. This happened in the 1950s for two reasons. First, as the population of the Sun Belt exploded after World War II from the Southeast to the Southwest, so did politi politicians' attention to the region. 
1950, uh, New York still had the largest number of electoral votes. But as the populations of states like California and Texas and Florida grew, they achieved greater electoral importance. These were also the states that had the largest Hispanic populations in the country. Second, as the Cold War in the Americas heated up in Puerto Rico and Mexico and Guatemala and Uruguay and Cuba and elsewhere, politicians began to see Hispanics as important brokers who through their business and political connections in Latin America could help the United States achieve its foreign policy objectives in the region. After they supported Eisenhower, Hispanic Republicans supported Barry Goldwater during his 1964 campaign. Here's a picture of Barry Goldwater with his kind of lead Hispanics or Latinos con Goldwater organizer, uh, Robert Benitez Robles, who sold uh, life insurance in Yuma, Arizona. Among other issues, Goldwater harped on the Kennedy administration's failure at the Bay of Pigs, which marked the very beginning of a long turning away of Cubans from the Democratic Party. Cubans at first liked Kennedy, but then came to see him as a traitor after he refused to send military backup to the Cuban exiles who led the 1961 invasion. Seizing the opportunity afforded by their criticism, Goldwater began to make inroads with Cubans in Florida and all along the eastern seaboard. He also drew support from Mexican Americans in the Southwest, especially in his native Arizona and California. But to be clear, Eisenhower's eight years in office and Goldwater's failed campaign in 1964, these were just early moments in the mutual embrace of Hispanics and the Republican Party. The Hispanic Republican movement began in earnest during Richard Nixon's first term in office. Before then, Republican presidential candidates won single digit support from Hispanics. And this changed dramatically in 1972 when Nixon won approximately a third of the Hispanic vote. He was the first Republican to do so, but he set the bar for all Republicans after him. As historians who've written about the period have made clear, Nixon's first term wasn't going well. There were, it was the war in Vietnam, campus protests, prison riots. So Nixon set out to both undermine his enemies and recruit new supporters. The former effort to undermine his enemies, of course, led to Watergate. The latter effort led him to recruit Hispanic voters. At the same time, during Nixon's first term, strategists were realizing that the Republican Party needed Hispanics as African Americans were leaving the party in droves. And they were very explicit about this. They believed that they had to make up lost support from African Americans from somewhere else, and Hispanics were their prime target. And Nixon recruited Hispanics by establishing the Cabinet Committee on Opportunities for Spanish-speaking peoples, which gathered the heads of the agencies that dealt most with so-called Hispanic issues like labor, agriculture, health, education, and welfare, etc. And they were to focus attention primarily on increasing federal employment opportunities for Hispanics. And this in fact led some Hispanic Republicans to oppose Nixon because instead of seeing him as a true conservative, they saw him as the quote, father of the quota system, as Linda Chavez called him. Nixon also sought support by making several high level appointments, including Romana Acosta Banuelos, who's the woman in this picture in the Oval Office, Nixon appointed her in 1971 as the first Hispanic treasurer of the United States. This kind of began a tradition of Republican presidents appointing Hispanic women to the post, including Catherine Ortega in uh, the Reagan administration, Kathy Vasquez Villalpando in the Bush administration, and there are several others in more recent years. In addition to Banuelos, Nixon appointed Hilario Sandoval as the head of the Small Business Administration and a gentleman named Benjamin Fernandez as the head of the National Economic Development Agency. And in fact, uh, you know, there, this, these high level appointments, they 
came to represent in the eyes of Republican presidents inclusion, how a particular Republican administration claimed to be inclusive of Hispanics and claimed to represent them. And many of these appointees were supposed to be key surrogates for presidential candidates out on the campaign trail. When they actually went out on the campaign trail, they were seen as something quite different. They were often called tokens or not representative of the, the kind of Latino that uh, Latinos broadly across the country needed to represent them. For the rest of the 70s after, and I should say that they were, sorry, I'm just backing up for one second. Some of these Hispanic surrogates, especially Banuelos, were actually given a lot of credit for Nixon's landslide re-election in 1972. So uh, Republican party officials in New Mexico, for example, would write letters to um, Banuelos after Nixon's victory in 1972 and point out that Nixon had been trailing in the polls in New Mexico before Banuelos visited, but as soon as Banuelos visited, Nixon leapt ahead in the polls. So they were given a lot of credit and kind of widespread admiration among Republicans in the Southwest, from Republicans in the Southwest. For the rest of the 70s, Republicans tried to duplicate uh, Nixon's success among Hispanics. They started to build out the party infrastructure, especially with the establishment of the Republican National Hispanic Assembly in 1974. And the RNHA, as it was called, it became an official auxiliary of the Republican National Committee headed by George H.W. Bush. The first national chairman of the RNHA was Ben Fernandez, who again had served in the Nixon administration. And this group became the power broker for Hispanic Republican politics. Gerald Ford, pictured here, courted their endorsement in 1976. And the Republican National Hispanic Assembly in many ways became a, a bullpen for future appointees by Republican presidents. Many of the national leaders of the RNHA came to occupy positions in several uh, Republican administrations. Ford himself didn't do very well among Hispanics and he lost the election to Carter, but his administration nevertheless had some key legacies for the history of the Hispanic Republican movement, including the recognition of the RNHA as a key influencer in Hispanic politics. He also appointed the first special assistant to the president of the United States for Hispanic affairs. This was the New Mexican Fernando de Baca and Ford's signing of the 1975 Amendment to the Voting Rights Act, which mandated the publication of materials, election materials, in Spanish as well as English, in communities with significant Hispanic populations. And it increased Hispanic political participation, and it was championed by a Republican president. This picture, by the way, is one of my favorites. It's of Gerald Ford at, um, at the Alamo in San Antonio, kind of in, in 1976, celebrating uh, the American Bicentennial. In the run-up to July of 1976, there were a whole bunch of celebrations across the country. And here, a reporter for the San Antonio Express News captured a picture of Gerald Ford biting into a tamal, which didn't have the shuck taken off of it. So he couldn't bite through the corn shuck. And um, this was seen as a sign of Gerald Ford's kind of cultural incompetence, how he didn't understand Latino communities in the Southwest. And it became known as the Great Tamale Incident. And in fact, uh, many political commentators argued that Gerald Ford lost Texas in 1976 to Jimmy Carter by a very narrow margin, just a little more than 100 thousand votes or around 200,000 votes. And they chalked it up to this kind of insensitivity. And then the idea is that, um, you know, he lost Texas and therefore lost the general election because he bit into an unshucked tamal. This is uh, an exaggeration, of course, but it's a moment where uh, Hispanics were kind of seen to be at the center of a national election. 
The national head of the RNHA, uh, again, Fernandez, his nickname was Boxcar Ben because, here, I'll pull a picture of him up. He was actually the person um, up on the first slide here. This is Ben Fernandez in 1980. We'll talk about him in a minute. Here he is a little bit earlier. So Boxcar Ben, he was born in a railroad boxcar, and he actually became the first Hispanic to run for president of the United States, you know, a couple decades before Bill Richardson ran and, you know, uh, some 35, 36 years before Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz ran in 2016. And he campaigned in the primaries in 1980 against Reagan, Bush, and others. He declared his candidacy in, the, in November 1978. And this is an important moment because it's the same month that Time Magazine ran a cover story about Hispanics that predicted that the 1980s would be the decade of the Hispanic. Their numbers were growing, they were integrated into all aspects of American life, and they would begin to influence American politics. And this was the beginning of the idea that Hispanics were a quote unquote sleeping giant that was about to wake up and uh, rule American politics. And Fernandez's whole presidential campaign uh, was based on this idea of Hispanic momentum. And he really thought that Hispanic voters were going to be his base. He had a really unique, some would say stupid, electoral strategy. He was going to skip, uh, the, skip out on Iowa and New Hampshire and the primaries there, and he would focus instead on the first ever Republican primary in Puerto Rico, which took place before these others. And his idea was that the island's Spanish-speaking voters would lift him there, and he would win the island's 14 delegates, and Americans elsewhere would then become curious about who was this Latino who won the first ever Puerto Rico primary. Then he would be off to the races. And you guys probably know this, but you know, Puerto Rico can participate in primary elections and send delegates to national conventions to help designate the nominee, but then they don't participate in the general election. This didn't happen. Fernandez came in third with less than 1% of the vote in Puerto Rico behind George H.W. Bush, who won 60%, and Howard Baker, the senator from Tennessee who had participated in the Senate Watergate hearings. He won some 35%. Bush's son, Jeb, who had just turned 27, was critical to his father's success in Puerto Rico. Jeb Bush had studied abroad in Mexico when he was at Andover Academy. He met his future wife, Colomba Garnica de Gallo, while he was on that trip. He majored in Latin American studies at UT Austin, and he worked at a Venezuelan bank after college. And he camped out in Puerto Rico for months before the primary there. Some people say he was sleeping in a tent in a park while one Puerto Rican Republican I interviewed told me that he stayed at his place on his couch. And Bush told Puerto Ricans that his father supported the one issue that mattered to them. This was statehood. And for Jeb, this was just the beginning of his popularity among Latinos, which was critical to him throughout his time as the governor of Florida and as a candidate for president in 2016. Here's Columba with the microphone here in her hand, and she's, of course, seated, ne seated nearby is uh, George H.W. Bush, the candidate, wearing his guayabera, and a woman named Julia Rivera de Vicente, who was seen as a kind of key Republican political organizer in Puerto Rico. As we know, uh, Reagan won the nomination and selected Bush as his running mate, and he was the first presidential candidate to launch a coordinated media campaign that targeted Hispanics. And this campaign, Reagan's media campaign, was run by the advertising maven from San Antonio named Lionel Sosa. 
And Sosa had assistance from Reagan's Hispanic campaign heads, Alex Armendariz and Fernando Oaxaca. Both of them were leaders of the Republican National Hispanic Assembly. They were also the heads of their own Hispanic media and public relations firms. They were also Mexican Americans from California, pointing to the fact that even in the run up to Reagan's election in 1980, Mexican Americans were still at the center of the Hispanic Republican movement. Reagan made a key innovation in recruiting Hispanics. He moved away from the patronage politics that defined Nixon's and Ford's efforts and toward identifying the issues that made Hispanics quote unquote natural Republicans, as he famously called them. These included family values, religion, anti-communism, and free market capitalism. Anti-communism and capitalism had been issues before, but Reagan's 1980 campaign was really the first time they featured in Hispanic outreach efforts. And Reagan went on to win about 30% of the Hispanic vote from Mexican Americans, Puerto Ricans, Central Americans, and a staggering 80% of the Cuban American vote. And Reagan could be just as polarizing for Hispanics as he was for other Americans. They liked his strident opposition to Castro, the fact that he had appointed Catherine Ortega and others, and that he advocated moderate border and immigration policies that were harsh, but not so harsh as what other Republicans, a kind of nativist wing of the Republican Party that's beginning to grow in the late 1970s. Reagan called Mexico the, the most important ally of the United States, and he argued in campaign visits with um, the Mexican president, Jose Lopez Portillo, that the United States didn't need a border wall that divided the two countries. But he was also in many ways seen as cold toward the interests of working class Hispanics in particular, and even Hispanic Republicans opposed the part of his immigration bill, the Immigration Reform and Control Act, that called for employer sanctions. Hispanic Republicans largely saw Reagan as a president who continued the era of inclusion that had begun during the Nixon years. They came to believe that they were influential in the Reagan White House and that they had a seat at the table for important policy discussions. But they were also really wary of rising nativism within the Republican Party, including the burgeoning movement to make English the official language of the United States. They appreciated the fact that Reagan remained dedicated to signing a comprehensive immigration bill, even though conflicts over the shape of the bill pushed its signing into his second term. Some Cuban Americans also in Reagan's second term began to express their frustration that despite Reagan's anti-communist bluster, Castro was still in power. And interestingly, the Iran-Contra scandal that plagued Reagan's second term really wasn't a problem for Hispanic Republicans. Leaders like the New Mexico representative Manuel Lujan spoke for many when he supported Reagan's Central America policy, including the supply of arms. In some ways, the Reagan years represented the pinnacle of the Hispanic Republican movement, the time when Hispanic Republicans believed that through decades of work and organization, they had achieved inclusion in the Republican Party. And George H.W. Bush capitalized on this movement in 1988 when he was elected with the usual third of Hispanic support. He benefited from the Hispanic support he had cultivated during his time as the head of the Republican National Committee and also during his first run for president in 1980. And by the late 1980s, Jeb had also become increasingly involved in South Florida's Hispanic political scene. He served as Congresswoman Ileana Ross Lettinen's campaign advisor. She became the first Cuban American elected to Congress. And Bush was also the first Republican to use a State of the Union speech as the occasion to call for Puerto Rican statehood, even though it had been included in the Republican Party platform since 1940. So during this period between 1988 and 1992, Hispanic Republicans still felt momentum. 
But by the end of Bush's first term, it was clear that the Republican Party was tacking rightward on immigration. Pat Buchanan challenged Bush in the 1992 primary, railing against the amnesty that had been granted to more than a million undocumented immigrants as a result of the 1986 bill. And as a columnist for the conservative Washington Times, Buchanan said it was foolish to consider introducing Puerto Rico as the 51st state of the union because it would be tantamount to incorporating a secessionist movement that he compared to the one in Quebec. And it, he argued that it would add hundreds of thousands of Puerto Ricans to the welfare rolls. And immigration was becoming an increasingly divisive issue in the states as well, with majority support in California for Proposition 187. Border restrictions like Operation Gatekeeper further militarized the border and the anti-immigrant movement traveled from California to DC as Congress debated and passed and as President Bill Clinton signed the Restrictive Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act of 1996. This is the ERIRA bill. And the backlash against Hispanics, against the party's rightward shift was so strong that Republicans nominated Bush's son, George W. Bush, who promised to restore humanity to the immigration and border debate. Hispanic Republicans hoped that candidates like him rather than Buchanan would define the future of the Republican Party. Bush promised a more compassionate conservatism and he won north of 40% of the Hispanic vote as a result. This was more than any uh, Republican president before him. But I think that seen in perspective, the perspective of the last quarter century, Bush's success between 2000 and 2008, even though many Hispanic Republicans hoped that it was going to define the Republican Party's future potential with Latino voters, instead has come to look a lot more like a blip, a kind of exception to the party's 24, five year move to the right on immigration. Yet it's important to note that despite changes within the Republican Party, about 30% of Hispanics continue to vote for Republicans, including John McCain in 2008, Mitt Romney in 2012, and yes, even Donald Trump in 2016. And they've continued to support Republicans not only because their policy preferences on particular issues align with those of the Republican Party, but also because they've supported Republicans for more than half a century. Hispanic Republicans have become loyal to the party. Unlike African Americans after Goldwater's and Nixon's embrace of the Southern strategy in the 1960s, Hispanics have not abandoned the party en masse. And it doesn't appear that they're about to do so now. Before I wrap up, I just wanna briefly describe how this project on Hispanic Republicans has sent me down a path that I'll likely follow over the next several years, pursuing other projects on Latino political history. Right now, first, I'm getting sidetracked a little bit by a project on the lifelong friendship between William F. Buckley, the founder of the National Review, and E. Howard Hunt, who helped plan the overthrow of Jacobo Arbenz in Guatemala in 1954, and also helped plan the Bay of Pigs operation in Cuba in 1961, and of course the break-in at the Watergate Hotel. That project kind of stemmed out of this one on Hispanic Republicans. But I do think that my longer term trajectory will be research and writing in the area of Latino political history. And in some ways, I think all Latino history is political, of course, since topics like labor and immigration, policing, civil rights, or assimilation are all inherently political. Yet in writing this book, I've realized that there's so much more that we just don't know about the formal participation of Latinas and Latinos in partisan politics, or the lack thereof. And I know that the, the new political history is a thing, but I don't think I'm uh, embarking on this project intending to engage this subfield. I think I began this work because I saw the history of Hispanic Republicans as a topic that had been ignored in the field of Latino history, 
one that's important for understanding Latinos in the United States today, and one that's personal to me because of my Hispanic Republican grandfather. Still, I do believe that Latino political history has things to teach historians of modern American politics in general, especially when it comes to how Latino politics has been shaped in the crucible of US Latin American relations and how Latino influence has been felt in the two major parties, in the case of the Republican Party as moderating influences in debates over immigration and the border. In the Hispanic Republican, I tried to write an overview of how the Republican Party and national Republican leaders have recruited Hispanics and the Hispanics who responded to their overtures or even formulated reasons for their partisan identities independently of any party apparatus. But even on this topic, Hispanic conservatism, I think there's so much more that could be done, including local studies that dive much deeper than I did on Puerto Rico, California, Texas, Florida. I also think it would be great to have a history of exactly how Latin American political identities as members of the Partido Acción Nacional in Mexico or the Partido Nuevo Progresista in Puerto Rico or counter-revolutionaries in Central America, how do those identities, Latin American political identities, get translated into partisan identities in the United States as Republicans or Democrats. I think I got interested in this topic because while interviewing um, the head of the Republican Party in El Paso, he told me that, I don't know what he does now in these times of pandemic, but before then he would go to every single naturalization ceremony held in El Paso and hand out literature about what the Republican Party stood for and what the values of the Republican Party were. So even at the moment of naturalization, the Republican Party was trying to incorporate uh, Mexican immigrants and immigrants from lots of other places into the Republican Party structure. I also think we need a history of Latino non-voters who form part of the 50% of eligible Latino voters who choose not to vote or the undocumented immigrants who can't vote but nevertheless influence the decisions of their family members or the Puerto Ricans who live on the island and can't vote in the general election but nevertheless sway elections by campaigning for their preferred candidates in Florida or New York and other states with large uh, Puerto Rican populations. There's just so much attention to the Latino vote when in some ways the real question about how Latinos will shape an election is how many of them will and will not vote. These are just a few of the other projects I you know, dreamed up while writing this one. And I think they all point to more work being done on Latino political history in general. And thank you so much again for letting me share some of my work with you. And I look forward to hearing your questions. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much, Jerry. I know we can't all go off mute. So this would be the point normally in better times where you'd be treated to deafening applause uh, oh, yeah. for, the, for the presentation and also for a fantastic book. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, on that. It is truly remarkable work, which I'm sure will find uh, audiences in not just in our tribe of historians, but uh, among political scientists, uh, sociologists, and of course, the general public. Congratulations. Thank um, you, and uh, a, a more timely uh, contribution I could not have thought of, given what's going to happen in what, 25, 26 days or so. Uh. Um, yeah, um, I, I just put something in the chat. This is the moment where I remind all of you in the audience Please do put your um, questions in the chat and we will uh, field those for Professor Kadava uh, momentarily. In the meantime, um, I've been asked here, our producer is saying, I should remind everyone that this event, event is in fact being recorded and will be available for viewing, your viewing and listening pleasure uh, afterwards. So please keep your eyes open for the link for that. And I should also mention, by the way, that uh, we'll be having a uh, listserv soon for the Lehman Center, which uh, I hope all of you will, will join and, and hear about our future programs. But in the meantime, uh, I wanna open up Q&A for Professor 
Kadaba, and I don't see anything just yet, which is great for me because I uh, I have a couple of questions of my own. Um, I I really love the way you've uh, uh, taken your ten chapters and organized into these four um, themes, or not even themes, but I guess like periods. Uh, it really gives us kind of wider breadth of uh, a political journey of sorts. And you, you touched on a lot of things. It goes seamlessly from Cold War to domestic politics to the regional politics. I think one of the things that I think many of us don't know um, or don't take into account is that how very much as Tip O'Neill once said, you know, all politics is local. I think that was Tip O'Neill. You would probably know better than I would, Jerry. Um, sounds, right. <laughs> sounds good enough, yeah. Um, and so be you, fact-checked here? I don't know. No, please do not. not <laughs> this is being recorded. Don't, don't prove me wrong on tape. But um, the way you, you seamlessly move in between these various, let's just call them theaters, uh, political activity, mm -hmm. um, from the, the, the small Republican clubs all the way to you have uh, people who are dead intent on over, uh, overthrowing Castro time and again. Um, it's, a, it's a really fascinating story. I wanted to ask you a bit more about um, a couple of questions. One was actually anticipated in your final comments about non-voting mm. uh, Latinx Americans and how that factors into this. Is there a certain way in which the prominence of the Hispanic Republican is not, I'm not gonna say inflated, but certainly it seems numerically larger, proportionally larger, yeah. because you don't, you're not including these people um, who aren't voting. Um, yeah. And I mean, that kind of, mm -hmm. I'm going to resist drawing the parallels in African American political history, um, even though I think of like Mayor no. Wright Rigger's work. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And like the, the, I think the title of her book is The Loneliness of the Black Republican yeah. or the Black Conservative. Um, but I'm, so I'm going to res resist drawing uh, those parallels, but it does occur to me that in a lot of ways, there is a black undercounted voted during due to you know many things, including voter suppression, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I was wondering about that. And then another question um, that I had as I was uh, reading, particularly the Nixon period and the Reagan period, um, and I wanted to ask you a bit more about labor union politics. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about uh, Jesse Jackson's bids which were incredibly successful. I mean, unless, I mean, he didn't get the nomination, but otherwise for what he was doing, he uh, had the most impressive showing uh, within a party of an African-American candidate, I think, until Barack Obama. Um, and this was not because he got a lot of black voters, which he did, I mean, but they clearly weren't enough to put him over the top. He had this interesting coalition of black voters, you know, urban liberals and labor unions. And so that made me think at this period of Reagan where there's this kind of attraction and, you know, rejection, depending on, you know, who's, in, you know, who in the party is articulating their sentiments. Where is the labor politics, I guess, in this story? How does that figure? If you could just draw this, draw that out for us as well. Because it's also a period where labor as a voting block is also kind of, I don't want to, I don't want to play into the declension narrative, but it's, kind of not as important as it was maybe some decades before. So I was just thinking about that. So you could take either one of those questions while, um, and there's a few more coming in on the, um, over the transom here, but I'll let you warm up on those two very insuccinct and drawn yeah. out questions. It, it, I mean, I, I know that you said you wanted to avoid the parallels with African-American history, but I am curious to know, is it, is it kind of argued within, is it argued by African-American historians that, um, African-American non-voters do have a particular partisan leaning that they, those who don't vote, if they did vote, would vote one way or another, or do we not know that? It's kind of, it's, it's a literal unknown, right? Yeah, um, right. And we don't yeah. know. I think one reason why you have, um, there's one party that's particularly, shall we say, resistant to any measures that would expand the franchise or access to the franchise. I'll let you yeah. in for which party I might to which I'm referring. Um, I think it's under the assumption they would vote for the other party. 
Yeah. Right. right. Uh, but I, right. but I, I, if what you're saying is we should not assume that, I absolutely agree with you. No, yeah, no, you, no. I, I, I think I would say something similar that the, you know, non-voters are super important, but we also don't know a lot about non-voters. I mean, we don't. I don't know um, if there are, are studies that say things like, you know, I do know. Here's what I do know about non-voters. We know that Latinos have historically, for a long time. I mean, since before the 1975 Voting Rights Act, which was meant as an effort to include them and increase their rates and political participation and have them register at greater numbers. But even since then, um, we know that Latinos have participated in elections at lower rates than other groups of Americans. I think. Um, Non-Latino whites participated about 65%, Latinos participated about 48%, Asian Americans participated 47 African Americans I think are a little higher uh, than Latinos, but not as high as non-Latino whites. And, you know, the thing, that, the thing that's important to remember is that that number of like who participates and who doesn't participate, it fluctuates in every election, you know, it's so in some elections, one strategy has been to drive down um, participation by Latino Democrats. This was one of the things that actually came to light during the Senate Watergate committee hearings. Nixon's Hispanic Republican supporters were trying to cut deals with uh, liberal Latino leaders, Democratic Latino leaders in Texas, for example. Um, oh, what's the guy's name uh, who started the uh, La Raza Unida party? Jose Angel Gutierrez, I think. Um, but anyway, he was cut, trying to, they were trying to cut deals with him to encourage him to have his supporters stay home and not vote. So that's an example from 1972, but I think there are versions of that story um, over the past 50 years. So my point is like who the American electorate is in general, but who Latino voters and non-voters are varies from election to election, depending on their enthusiasm for the candidate, depending on voter suppression efforts, all of these things. And, you know, so I don't think we know a lot about, um, about who Latino non-voters are, except some obvious things like undocumented people can't vote, but we know that they sometimes live with uh, and are friends with or family members with people who do vote and can influence their vote that way, or Puerto Ricans who literally fly to New York, for example, to campaign for Governor Nelson Rockefeller, even though they themselves can't vote. So we know something about those Latino non-voters and, you know, when they show up as Republicans campaigning for Republicans, we know something about them there. But, but generally, you know, we don't know a lot about who non-voters are. Um, there's more studies of like why they don't vote, reasons from, you know, ranging from, um, alienation from the political process in general, the fact that they live in non-competitive states like California or New York or Illinois and therefore don't believe that their uh, votes count, those kinds of things. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think this election cycle, for example, in 2020, one thing I've been asked a lot and, you know, an idea that's floating around is that there's a question like is the Latinos for Trump campaign actually trying to win new Latino voters and persuade Latinos and to try to expand Latino support for Donald Trump or is he trying to you know muddy the water of the whole thing to make it seem as though both candidates are equally bad to encourage Latinos who don't like him aren't sold on Joe Biden to just stay home so I think both of those things happen at the same time. I, I do think he's trying to win Latino support at the same time that um, he might drive down Latino support in areas like Central Florida, South Florida, things like that. At this point, I'm just talking about a lot of things related to voting and non-voting. I think the main point would be like what you said, we don't know a whole lot about the political leanings and partisan affiliations of non-voters. Um, the labor question is really interesting, and I think that the parties kind of, um, this is another way in which parties realign, I think, in the mid to late 20th century. I mean, for a long time, it was Democrats who were, um, you know, when it came to immigration, for example, they were trying to protect 
American jobs or Mexican American jobs by opposing like the, the Bracero program and um, any of these Mexican guest worker programs or visa programs. And, you know, famously and controversially, the labor leader Cesar Chavez for much of the 1950s and into the 1960s opposed um, Mexican immigration and opposed uh, the Bracero program because he was trying to protect the jobs of Mexican American workers. And in those years, it was actually Republicans who were the most vocal supporters of extending the Bracero program year after year. That sw switched um, in the 1970s, I think, when um, you know union politics shifted and uh, Republican politicians and many Hispanic Republicans who were business owners and began to argue that you know vocif vociferously against labor unions and unions among their own employees um, with with arguments about how like you know their employees didn't need um, labor unions to represent them because they ran their businesses like kind of uh, like patrons you know and they really took care of their employees um, so they didn't need a labor union but um, that's an incomplete answer and um, but it's what I've got right now. <laughs> Great, thank you, thank you so much, Jerry. And again, yeah, take a take a sip. You've been talking for a while there, so and and it's not over yet. We have the chat room is really buzzing here. There's a lot of really good questions here for you. Yeah. Um, one of uh, I'm going to go from uh, Shakti Castro, who is asking, how have your interview subjects reconciled some of that anti-immigrant? This is really going. She actually, I think, like foreshadowed your answer to this question. This is, um, she's, she, she's asking you, how have your interview subjects reconciled some of that anti-immigrant and anti-Brown and anti-Black rhetoric the Republican Party espouses with their political and cultural identities? So, I, and again, she's asking about your interview subjects. So I, when you yeah. do these interviews, there's a lot of intimate time, right? I mean, yeah. at a certain point, I imagine you certainly ask that question. To someone, oh, yeah. What do they have to say? Oh, man. Um, I mean, they say a lot of things. They say a lot of things. They say, just for an example, I interviewed a current candidate for the tech, no, for the US Congress, actually, from the Rio Grande Valley in South Texas. Um, and, you know, she's running for a congressional seat in a district that's like 90% Latino. She's running in a district that has historically been Democrat but it's near the border and she's lived there her whole life and she, you know border security and harsh well she wouldn't call them harsh but strict immigration enforcement those are like two of her major issues and actually her district is near like eagle pass and it's right near where all of the detention centers that were getting national news attention are located um and she says that you know Mexican immigrants do in fact commit crimes in the United States. That's what she says. She also says that many of the immigrants who um, are coming brought to the many immigrant children who are brought to the United States by adults are being trafficked for sex work and border patrol officers are in fact the only people who are trying to protect them. And when it comes to what we recognized as family separation, she was saying that many immigrant children are brought across the border, not by their parents, but by um, you know, others who are trying to enter the United States illegally and using the children as a way to um, remain in the United States. That's one version of what gets said. And you know, I think the the point is they're they're not they wouldn't in some ways they wouldn't accept the premise of the question that this is a contradiction that they need to reconcile in part because they want to draw lines between immigration and illegal immigration they say this over and over and it relates to part of how they defend Donald Trump by saying that He's not anti-immigrant, he's anti-illegal immigrant. And, you know, we, you know, scholarship, generations of scholarship, decades of scholarship have kind of blurred the lines between 
illegal and legal immigrants and how even legal immigrants or citizens, people who have been in the United States for generations can often get construed as illegal immigrants and all of these things. So nevertheless, this is what they say. They also say that, you know, they might recognize that. And, you know, I will, I, I will repeat that historically, Hispanic Republicans on the issue of immigration have sided more, this is the one issue where they are more like Latino Democrats than they are other members of their own party. They don't, you know, they don't believe that the Republican Party is a nativist, uh, xenophobic party. They still want to believe that it's the inclusive party of the Reagan years and the Bush years. And they don't, they, they, I've been told many times that they don't believe that Donald Trump is racist. They just don't believe it. They think that he's loud, crass, whatever, but they don't believe that he's racist. So, um, you know, they, they don't see themselves as members of a nativist party. They don't see the Republican Party, they, they don't see these things as at odds. I know it's like hard to wrap your head around, it's hard to wrap my head around. Um, and as tempting as it might be to, for us to call this like a, a contradiction or something that doesn't make sense, they have to square, I don't think that they see it this way. And I meant to um, Hillary Hallett, our, our co-director, asked a similar question about the current party and mentioned particularly the, the virulent racist organizations yeah. that do support Trump. Um, mm -hmm. And she pointed particularly to Trump's uh, unwillingness to denounce the Proud Boys in the yeah. debate last week. Do, I mean, I, I know you literally just answered the question, but even with that type yeah. of evidence, yeah. um, Hispanic Republicans are just kind of just there's blinders on that. Like, well, after... did you see? Uh, did you guys see the news last week? That the national head of the Proud Boys is Latino. He's All a, right. Yeah. He's a Cuban American dude from uh, South Florida who uh, is the national chairman of the Proud Boys, but also the head of the Latinos for Trump campaign in Florida. And there's just a lot to say there. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot to say there. He, when talking about it in an interview, he said that. The Proud Boys kind of reminded him of the kind of social scene he grew up in, in a Cuban American household where he had a bunch of like uncles and cousins who would always, you know, rib each other and roast each other. It was kind of like a male frat scene in South Florida and uh, it gave him a sense of belonging. And so at the same time, we know all of these things about, um, you know, whiteness and Latinos and, you know, Race is a whole conversation we could have in the Latinos' racial self-conceptions, um, but there certainly is. There's another woman named um, Cecilia Marquez who teaches at Duke who is writing a first project about African-American Latino relations in the South, but her second book is about the Latino far right, who the Latino far right that participates in like chat rooms like on Stormfront and they really see themselves as, um, you know, they're, they're really kind of leaning into this white patriot identity. Um, so there's, you know, there's a lot. But the, the other thing I could say is that, you know, I, the, maybe it's still true that the thing that will break the Republican Party in the long run is having to as, as uh, the first question put it, like reconcile these two contending forces, you know, the, the big tent umbrella Republican party that's inclusive and that was kind of called forth by the 2013 um, so-called autopsy report. It was called like the Growth and Opportunity Project where after Mitt Romney's devastating loss, and again, like all reports were that Mitt Romney woke up on election day thinking he was going to win the election, hadn't prepared a concession speech, but he lost. And that was, you know, it was chalked up in large part due to Obama's victories in swing states with large Latino populations like Nevada and Colorado and Virginia. And a few months later, the Republican Party issued the Growth and Opportunity Project where they talked about um, you know, needing to create space in the party for Latinos, Asian Americans, women, uh, 
of America, I said Native Americans, Asian Americans, some people are going to be like the rainbow coalition of the Republican Party. And that's why I think it made sense in 2016 that early on in the primary campaign, folks like Marco Rubio and Jeb Bush seemed to be front runners because they were going to be representative of this new Republican Party. But at the, actually, we know now what happened was that it's this other wing of the Republican Party that had been growing from the 1970s forward. I mean, where, where you want to date the rise of nativism and xenophobia within the Republican Party, I mean, we probably shouldn't just limit it to the late 1970s forward, but for sure through groups like the Federation for American Immigration Reform, US English, the rise of Pat Buchanan as a serious primary challenger to George H.W. Bush. In many ways, this is the wing of the Republican Party that helped elect Donald Trump to office. So I think a lot of us were caught off guard by that. Maybe we shouldn't have been because especially us, you know, this group of people who actually has studied um, some of these nativist xenophobia movements over a long period of time, maybe we shouldn't have been surprised. But I do think that it's, it's still possible, just like the, you know, Democrats have divisions between progressives, moderates, whatever you want to call them, the Republican Party is still, regardless of who wins in 2024, going to have to face this situation at some point, whether they, you know, try to expand their party or continue to focus on Trump's like nationalism, isolationism, things like that. Great. I'm going to go to um, Ivan Padilla uh, Rodriguez asked you, thank you so much for a wonderful talk, a wonderful and informative talk. Um, I was hoping you could expand more on how historically Hispanic Republicans wrestled with exclusionary refuge, refugee, I'm sorry, I need to scroll down here. Yeah. Um, how Hispanic Republicans wrestled with exclusionary refugee and asylum policies and intervention in Latin America, particularly during the Reagan era and how this history informs our understanding of current Hispanic Republican perceptions of refugee uh, waves and policies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting question about the 80s compared with now. Um, let me think about that for a minute, but as I think about it, I'll try to get to the first part of your question, which is, um, you know, Republicans and sanctuary and refugee policy during the Reagan years. And, you know, I think this is probably a overly simplistic way of putting it, but in some ways it's also true that refugees fleeing from left-wing leftist states or states controlled by leftist leaders were seen as good and groups that we should welcome and those from other kinds of places were not welcome. They were cast as like economic migrants. They weren't refugees and therefore didn't kind of fall. You know, you, I'm sure you know that the, there was also the 1980 Refugee Act, which talked about the distinctions between economic migrants and refugees. And if a group of migrants was deemed to be economic migrants, then they didn't have to be granted asylum. So this is what happened with Guatemalans, for example. Um, they were called economic migrants because they had been fle fleeing from uh, uh, the Pinochet, not Pinochet, I'm sorry, the uh, Rios Mont regime in Guatemala. But Nicaraguans, for example, who had been fleeing the Sandinistas were seen as a different story. So uh, Ileana Ross Lettinen, um, is a good example of this because she's a Cuban American. Her father was uh, Enrique Ross, who was a, you know, fled Castro's Cuba and that whole narrative. And she, I mean, and many Cuban Americans like explicitly argued that Nicaraguans in the 1980s are just like we were in the 1960s. So we have to support them. And we also know that, um, veterans of the Bay of Pigs operation literally helped train the Contras in Miami. And they did so because they thought they were providing the same kind of support that they had received uh, during the Bay of Pigs operation. So that's one of the, you know, talk about like, you know, all these conversations about like Latino solidarity and whether Latinos are even 
you know, one ethnic group, in this case, Cuban Americans, and were kind of saying that they were one and the same with Nicaraguans because of this history of, you know, um, struggles against leftist leaders in Latin America. How to think though about like refugee politics now compared with then, I'm kind of tempted to say that just the contexts of 1980 and today are so different um, in, in some critical ways. I mean, um, the refugee and immigration situation in the 1980s was defined by the politics of the Cold War in a lot of ways. Um, the numbers of immigrants skyrocketed, undocumented immigrants as well, skyrocketed after the 1980s, even after the Immigration Reform and Control Act. The, um, you know, we have a, a Republican leader in office now who is trying to limit not, not only undocumented immigration, but also legal immigration. So I think all of these things, you know, the changing numbers of immigrants, the different groups of immigrants who are coming, the fact that even though, you know, many Cubans in South Florida still are kind of playing out the Cold War, we're not in the Cold War moment anymore, and we have a president who is trying to limit legal immigration in addition to illegal immigration, just make the 1980s and, and our moment so similar. But I would actually, I don't know, I know that I'm supposed to be talking more, but if Yvonne, if you have any ideas about that, I would love to hear them um, either now or later. Thanks, I'm going back to the queue here. Um, our colleague, Carl uh, Jacoby, has a question and sends his compliments uh, saying, great talk and a great book. Uh, this is a two for two questions. First is, um, how do you see your work in dialogue or perhaps not with other recent historical literature about the rise of conservatism after the Second World War? Uh, I guess part two of that is what methodological issues did you encounter researching a movement that is presumably rather distant from your own politics? I think that, that sounds, Carl, forgive me if I'm imputing more to this question. It, this might be, a, this might be the question where he's slightly asking you, so are you, wh where are you voting next month? But oh, uh, yeah. you don't, you don't need to answer that part. But oh, I, um, I'm happy to answer it. I mean, I'm happy to answer it, definitely. Uh, but you know, I should actually say yeah. though, um, and I'm jumping over Carl's question here, reading the book, um, it wasn't entirely clear. Like you're actually really like, you, I don't want to say even handed because of course you are, we're all professionals here, but it's not clear, it's, you're not slamming anybody here. You're actually really, you give a very sympathetic treatment to people whose arguments and strategies, you know, are things with which we might not ordinarily in our other lives have sympathy. So yeah. that's one of the many things I really like about the book. So anyway, yeah. back to Carl's question. Um, the first is about the literature about the, you know, modern American conservatism after World War II, yeah. with the second part being methodological issues. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting about, of, of course, by the time I started writing this book, I was familiar with this kind of boom in uh, historiography of the new conservatism and the conservative movement after World War II. But I, I mean it sincerely that that was not my point of departure for thinking about this project. I was trying to understand it in the context of Latino historiography and just seeing this as a group of Latinos that had not been written about. I mean, I think in terms, if this relates to the other question, because I think my Hispanic Republican grandfather is important here and the way that I was able to recognize him as an important part of our family, but also, you know, a, a Latino in Arizona was this, his experience and the kind of broader story that he is representative of. I just didn't see it told in Latino history. And, you know, there, through researching, I think I'm interested in this because in researching my first book too, I wrote about a Republican department store owner named Alex Hakome. And, you know, he was called by a lot of students at the University of Arizona, for example, in the 60s and 70s Chicanos. He was called, uh, you know, a pocho, a race trader, a sellout, a tío taco, someone who wasn't representative of his community. Also in my classes on Latino history, when I taught that chapter about the Mexican-American department store owner, my Latino students would literally say 
he shouldn't be counted as a Latino. We shouldn't consider this Mexican American a Latino because, you know, as though um, some sort of political identity was a prerequisite for even, you know, inclusion in a class on Latino history. And so that was, those kinds of things were the point of departure for me for the project because, um, you know, I think, you know, this idea, I was just asked this question yesterday about like, but how much of, how much of Latino Republican identity has to do with self-hatred? Don't they just hate themselves a little bit? And I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I can't answer that as a historian, but I don't at all think it's a useful way of arguing politically. You know, you're not drawing, if you think the goal is to draw people in, if you still believe in the idea that it's important to have conversations with people you don't agree with. And I recognize that some people don't think that. Some people think it's too far gone. But if you believe that, I don't think asking someone if they hate themselves is, an, is a useful starting point for involving them in a conversation about what their beliefs are. So I think that's just one, one of the many ways in which Latinos get stereotyped. I don't think that advances the cause of understanding who Latinos are. And as a historian, I really do see my goal is to explain more than to justify or take a side in or something like that. Maybe that's naive, I don't know. Um, but my point is that that was my point of departure for the project, not trying to figure out how this story fit in with all of these other excellent new books about the conservative movement. That said, I do think that Hispanic Republicans do have something to teach us about the conservative movement over the past, you know, 70 years. Just to name one, I think that Hispanic Republicans show us how the conservative movement was shaped in dialogue with Latin America and often like Latin American conservatives and conservative Latinos and American conservatives in the United States were in cahoots. They were in, you know, part of the same project. They wanted to reshape the Americas much in the same way. And in some ways you could understand the, um, you know, conservative movement in the United States as this kind of hemispheric dialogue with conservative Latin Americans. And I think that the role the Hispanic Republicans played in that as kind of mediators and cultural brokers between conservatives in the United States and Latin America is one, one thing that Hispanic Republicans can teach us. The question about like my, how I positioned myself in this project, this was really hard and I still don't, I still don't know how I did. I still don't um, know how the Hispanic Republicans I interviewed read my project. Um, I do know that Linda Chavez, um, she was the director of the Office of Public Liaison in the Reagan administration. She was George W. Bush's nominee to become the labor secretary until it was discovered that she had been living with a Guatemalan woman who was undocumented and then she had to withdraw her nomination. She's now like at a right-leaning think tank in Washington, DC. She didn't like how I talked about her in particular because she sent me a kind of angry email telling me that she thought I had misrepresented, not misrepresented, but I took out of context her anti-immigrant positions in the late 1990s because you know, her track record is that she has actually published much more in support of immigration, arguing that immigration to the United States is good than this anti-immigration piece that she had written in the 1980s. So she thought I could have like offered more context and whatever. Plus, you know, this might be going a little too deep. Um, Twitter is a thing where like, I follow a lot of Hispanic Republicans on Twitter and, you know, thinking about me trying to like maintain my expertise as a historian at the same time that I might express political views on Twitter that make clear that I'm liberal and Democrat, that doesn't always feel comfortable to me because I know that some of the Hispanic Republicans that I write about 
can see my Twitter feed as well. And I worry that, you know, I worry that the people I interviewed basically in a nutshell, I worry that they um, are always looking to kind of out me as uh, truly a liberal, even though I had, I don't know how I presented myself to them. I think I presented myself to them as a historian. I didn't make any promises to them about what I was going to write or not write. And I ran all of the quotes from our interviews that I was going to use in the book. I ran all of that by them. They signed off. But I do worry that they will read the book and kind of, I will out myself as a liberal and then lose all credibility in their minds. But that's another interesting question. Why do I feel like it's important to have credibility in their eyes? I, you know, I'm not sure. So there's a whole like thicket of issues when it comes to writing about people that you don't disagree with if you are going to interview them and kind of establish um, relationships with them. I, I do think I, I'm, I'll wrap up soon. I know I'm going on too long, but I know that um, I learned some lessons from my first book. When I wrote about this conservative department store owner, I, in some ways, so I, I kind of befriended his son, uh, Felipe Jacome. And to the point that Felipe Jacome, the son of this department store owner, was incredibly generous with me, gave me access to photographs, family letters, all kinds of things. And I think that, you know, we had a correspondence that lasted years. And I think that by developing that relationship with him, he thought that I was going to write something about his father that he was going to like and that I he was going to approve of. He hated it. And he sent me like a really the nastiest email I've ever got, including telling and relationships and friendships with people who I interviewed, even if they were giving me access to family papers. And um, I think I saw that my internet connection is unstable. So I hope that uh, you some of it got email, blocked but, out there. And it was right when you were about no, to give I, us the juicy bits about the worst email you've ever received. And I don't know if that was like an automatic oh, yeah. sensor in Zoom that cut out all the curse words and whatever. Yeah, but, right. But, maybe, maybe Felipe Jacome is watching. But, you know, basically he he told me that I was going to hell. And then he sent me a follow-up letter to tell me that his wife told me, told him that I'm going to hell and that I'm a bad person, you know? So, you know, the lesson for me was that you shouldn't, you know, that I shouldn't, somehow I felt like I had undermined my own like authority or objectivity. And I don't think I made promises to him. And on the one hand, I think that like, when you're writing about the father of a still living son, nothing you could say about them would be satisfactory to them because you couldn't possibly capture all of that feeling, all of that person's feelings about their father in a chapter in a book, you couldn't. And so I probably didn't make him the like multi-dimensional complicated father that he would have liked to see. So maybe that's part of the lesson. But I also learned that, you know, even with someone that you're interviewing, who's giving you access to family photos and, you know, you want to have them trust you, you want to develop a rapport, but I do think it's important to have the clear bound you about them you're not writing for them you're not beholden to them in any way so it's it's tricky and i still feel that way i mean i do think the last thing i'll say is that i think the fact that my father is a his my grandfather is a hispanic republican i do think that helped me have conversations with them because i i, I mean my grandfather is a complex full human being. I, I know him to be a, a good, decent human being, even if I um, disagree with him politically. And I think having had these conversations over a long period of time with my own grandfather helped me approach these conversations with other Latino Republicans from a like understanding point of empathy or something like that. Yeah, it's, it's very delicate and complicated and you're, you're very deft at um negotiating that. <clears throat> there are a number of parts in the book where as a reader, I was thinking, what was it like to interview this person? And, you know, try to get that sort of the insight or try to put yourselves in, in their minds. At, and how were they thinking at this period? And what are they thinking about as you're talking to them? Um, it's not easy yeah. talking. Um, uh, my recent work is more in the contemporary period. And so 
whereas my first was not. And I started interviewing a lot of people who were still alive. And it's not, I, I can yeah. sympathize with you. Um, Hillary and Nikita, uh, are we, is our cutoff time 3.30 or 4? I forgot. It won't get cut off. Okay. But we're supposed to go till 3.30 or do we, because in which case, that might have been our last question there. Okay. I think it was. I know. Um, all right. In that case, and I know a lot of our folks did leave at exactly 3.30. So I think, yeah. I suspect 3.30. Hillary, yeah, is that 3.30. It was Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry to those of you who are still in the room and had questions up here. Uh, there were some great ones as well. Um, for a great scholar and a great book, congratulations, Jerry, on a fantastic work. I'm sure it's going to keep you busy, particularly um, not just the next few weeks, but probably for many weeks and months afterwards. You'll be on the lecture circuit. Oh, man. So, um, as thank you. Thank you for yeah. having me. And I'm, I'm sorry that my long windedness in answering some of these questions meant that we didn't get to all of them. Not at all. They were they were excellent questions and they deserved an in depth answer. Yeah. Sorry, I think I'm I spoke happy to carry on there. the conversation at any time. No, it's okay. We'll I have to bring you I'm back. happy to carry on the conversation. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. Be safe out there. Bye bye, you guys. Take Thanks. care. Good to see you. Thanks, Jerry. Take care, everybody. Good evening.